Good morning. <clears throat> Happy, Good morning. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Today we're going to be looking at Inside Out, how Christ really turned everything inside out when he came. And so our memory verse text this morning is from Mark 7.15. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the thing which comes out of him, those are the things which defile a man. Now, I think that was probably confusing for many because they were so careful about not touching the unclean. I can't defile myself by touching the unclean. And, and here comes Christ and he goes, no, it's not what you touch, it's what comes out of you. And so what is he trying to say here, do we think? God looks at the heart. <coughs> yeah. I don't know that they said as much as we do today. Yeah. Think yeah. Well, I think <coughs> having been to Israel, it's, oh, shoot. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so as, as we look at it, really, uh, Michelle is right. It's what comes out of the heart. It's the same things we say, the things we do, that tells others and tells God where our heart truly is. And so it's not the things we put in. It can be sometimes the things we put in, but it's what comes out and how we are with, with each other. Well, now that I have a microphone, <laughs> and I make my comment. <laughs> sure. so, so my comment was that when, uh, going to Israel, they had all these mikvah baths, mm -hmm. so that every home, especially the more luxurious ones, had this whole room where they had dedicated to cleanliness, so they would take baths. And I think their main concern was if they touched a Gentile or somebody unclean or touched anything in the marketplace, they would all have to go through these elaborate baths. These were just for cleanliness. This was for ritual purposes. So there were, there were two different, different issues. One was cleanliness, just to be clean for health, and the other was ritual. Thank you. <clears throat> but during his ministry, Jesus exalted the scriptures of a, as a revelation from God. When quoting the Old Testament, though teachers of Israel knew the Hebrew scriptures well, human tradition was for most of them more preeminent than biblical instructions. With this context in mind, we're going to look at our study today. It will be selected <coughs> um, discussions between Jesus and the Pharisees. And Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, from it, its earliest years, the Jewish child was summoned with requirements of the rabbis. Rigid rules were prescribed for every act, down to the smallest details of life. Under the synagogue, teachers... <coughs> was it summoned or saddled? Yes, saddled would make more sense. Surrounded, okay. Did I say the wrong word? Summoned, you said, but it... Oh, it's surrounded. Okay. It is surrounded. Sorry. <coughs> anyway, they were surrounded by the requirements of the rabbis. Rigid rules were prescribed for every act down to the smallest details of life. Under the synagogue, teachers, the youth were instructed in countless regulations which, as Orthodox Israelites, they were expected to observe. But Jesus did not interest himself in these matters. From childhood, he acted independent of the rabbinical laws. The scriptures of the Old Testament were his constant study and his word. Thus saith the Lord was ever upon his lips. So he didn't pay attention to all the traditions and rituals. All he was interested in is what God had to say. <coughs> and back then, most of them were, from, were, were the, the books of Moses that they studied, and much of the Old Testament as well. As the condition of the people began to open his mind, he saw that the requirements of society and the requirements of God were in constant collision. Men were departing from the word of God and exalting theories of their own invention. Do we see that today? Yes, we do. They were observing traditional rites that 
possessed no virtue. Their service was mere round of ceremonies. Their sacred truth was designed to teach were here were hidden from the worshipers. We saw that in the fa their fatherless services, they found no peace. They did not know the freedom of the spirit. What would come to them by serving God in truth? Jesus had come to teach the meaning of the worship of God, and he could not sanction the mingling of human requirements with his own precepts. So we see <clears throat> here nothing new, there's nothing new under the sun. When Jesus came, he was struggling with traditions. He was struggling with man's ideas of what the Bible said. Today, we're seeing the same thing. We're struggling, where people are struggling with <coughs> men's theories and, and not of us, saith the Lord. So this week, we're going to look at Mark 7. We're going to look at Mark 8, <coughs> some of Mark 8. We're going to see how Christ stirs up this controversy that, that goes on between um, uh, thus saith the Lord and tradition. So as we get into this, we're going to see him travel to Tyre, to Sidon, and he's going to share this gospel message throughout. So Michelle, <clears throat> would you like to talk about human tradition tradition versus God's commands. Uh, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> As we're talking and reading and this week, I've been pondering, you know, the relationship of what we're studying to our ourselves as really overwhelmed by human traditions, but we are. Yes. You know, it's becoming more and more Polluted as time goes on, because speaking to this, or oh, well, maybe I didn't plug it well. Okay, okay, okay. We might have to share. Oh, I don't know how we do this. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> because I, I, I stuck it behind me, so you got to put it like this. Yeah, share it. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Maybe we fix it and I get to. Okay, I hope you sure. can hear me now. Okay, all right. So I'll start over that, you know, this week I was pondering like the, the effect of human traditions in our day to day today. We don't think ourselves as overwhelmed by that. You know, we think that our heart discerns and we can discern, but it's becoming more and more complicated and complex because we line ourselves up with the traditions of the whole culture all around us who, that is influenced by what men dictate as the norms of uh, a very um, underhanded tradition nowadays. So anyway, um, as we're looking at this lesson on Sundays, we're studying about human traditions versus God's commands. So as we're studying the book of Mark, I think we can start and um, read chapter 7 of Mark, uh, verses 1 through 13. And if someone will help me and read it out loud, uh, it's, easy, it's hard for me to see the screen, so I really need your help. I'll, I'll read it. <coughs> They don't have a microphone today, so we have to do the reading. Oh, so. No, 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 you can't. There's no microphone today. We're having technical difficulties. Okay, so I'll read it. Oh, okay, we'll read it. Uh, can we put our, on the screen Mark 7, verses 1 through 13? If not, we can open our Bibles. We always have, okay, there it is. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Going on. I need the next slide, please. Okay, if not, I can read it. Yeah, go ahead. Verse 4 says, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like washing of cups, 
pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? <coughs> he answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So, going on in verse 8, if you're following Mark chapter 7, verse 8, Jesus continues. These were the words of Jesus, and now he continues. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Other things you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your that is dedicated to the temple that was the meaning of Corban and you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down and many such things you do so as we read this text I'm sure there were thoughts that came to your mind and that's what I would like us to discuss and kind of look at now one of the question uh, the question on this what relevant truths were presented here what did we see um, I mean yes the, you know we can draw the wrong conclusions we can say okay we no longer have to wash our hands and do all these things um, <coughs> you know, but is this about hygiene no what is this about this is about ritual washing ritual washing and um, you know um, where was ritual washing that they had picked up these rules um, that they now were following where did they have the root and who told them to wash their hands God so probably it started was with, yeah um, I guess it started with some of the rules Moses gave them in Leviticus and I think the priests yeah. before they were supposed to enter the temple had to wash in this basin yes um, okay so he was without a microphone you might not have heard what he was saying and I'm gonna pick it up from here while he's getting set up because what we're gonna look at exactly what Scott was saying that some of these rules originally applied only to the priests in the <coughs> Old Testament and if we look at some of those texts that you know the children of Israel were familiar with that we now find some of them in Exodus 30 verses um, 17 through 21 if we can we have that on the screen and um, Barbara can you share sure. that the Lord spoke to Moses saying you shall also make a layer of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing you shall put it between the tabernacle of the meeting and the altar and you shall put water in it for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it Continue. Can I participate a little bit on this? Because There's no. Oh, yeah, I think it's working now. Go ahead. I, I just want to. I just want to understand, and, and, and Michelle, I, I'm so glad that you really are getting to the point. The point is very simple, and the point is that defilement comes from within. We're going there. Defilement is not something that I am going to purchase. Defilement comes from within. The washing of hands was not, had nothing to do with hygiene. It really had to do with the practices of the past. That thought that when I washed my hands, I became righteous. <laughs> and that defilement is from within. When we experience defilement, it is always from within. Amen. 
and Victor jumped to the punchline of our lesson today. Um, so, um, as we unpack, <laughs> as we unpack, you know, we are trying to see also, you know, like some of the, what was happening when Jesus was interacting with the people of his day, and then take it and translate it to our day today. And Victor is totally correct. It's about the heart. Um, they looked at the things, you know, the root of, God didn't tell them not to wash their hands. The root was, um, you know, God had directed at the temple that there, they would have this ritual of washing of the hands that we had to do with purity of the heart. And they had taken it totally out of context, made new rules to it, where now everybody had to comply with these rules and wash their hands, uh, you know, constantly uh, for ritual purposes. It wasn't even necessarily. So, you know, as we watch Jesus on his ministry on earth, we see him understanding, knowing the heart of God. Um, we know that he read the scriptures and knew the scriptures. Uh, we have many instances in the Bible that tell us that he did. Like, uh, it's not in our text today, but, you know, we remember that when he was fairly young, that I think he was 12 years of age, and he was at the temple when his parents left him behind and then came and found him, uh, searching for him <laughs> days later, when we read in that text that the teachers at the temple were very impressed with his understanding and knowledge and discernment of everything that God had put out. So, you know, while they had convoluted this, Jesus off, uh, again and again brought the people of his day back to the meaning uh, and the um, purposes of God. And actually, actually, as we watch Jesus on his journey, that's what he's doing. He's bringing them back to God and the meaning of everything. So, today's lesson is telling us it's about the heart. So now I'm going to um, read a few other texts, like Exodus 30, 17 through 21 continues um, and describes this. If someone will finish that text, and then we're going to move to Isaiah, and then again to Exodus. When they go to the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. So that was at the temple that uh, God had established that the priests would, would go through this. Now the next text that we will read is Isaiah 29 verses with verse 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have moved their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Now our Lord knows all these texts. They, well, they focus on only a few and took, take them and make them whatever. Um, in Isaiah 29, we see that even God is pointing to the heart. And even in, in Isaiah's time, um, there were strong rebukes to the nation that honors God in word, but whose heart is far from him. So then Jesus, you know, when he's answering them, this is what he's quoting. Um, he is not answering their questions directly because they ask how come they don't wash their hands. He's pointing to the heart. Um, so the next text where we can look at and see um, the second part of Jesus' reply relating to something else in the Old Testament, and that's Exodus 20 with verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. So, if yep. someone has uh, something to add, I thought I heard a, a voice, but... Um, so Jesus is taking them back to the meaning of everything. And while they've taken the uh, rules of Moses, the law of Moses, as the thing, and they've made it the biggest thing, they have lost track of the heart of God, which we find, and the character of God, which is found throughout the scriptures, but quite clearly outlined in 
the Ten Commandments. Um, so even something so clearly spoken by God and instructed to honor mother and father, they had found a way around it. So they had put aside God's instruction for them, and they had found a way around it all, and taken it out of context and made it something totally different. And they had enslaved so much the people to doing all these ritualistic things without really teaching God and without sharing truly the heart of God with everyone. So uh, that's what Jesus is drawing them back to. Um, so um, if you have comments, I sometimes I'm seeing your smile on your faces and now you have thoughts, feel free to share them. As I think we're going to come to the end of this day, but truly, what are you hearing Jesus say here? And maybe that merits a comment, you know, I, I, I know that I talk long and I should sometimes no, no, no. say a word, but uh, here's, here's the significance for me. Who's my father in life? God is. Mm -hmm. God, yes. God is. In the, uh, and of course, my father, biologically, my father and mother, humanly speaking, they were my father and mother and the family. <coughs> What the Lord is telling me is this to me, Victor, if you do not recognize that I am your creator, I am your God, your father, and your mother, you really do not have a journey worthy of any way. That's really what that means. That verse is really saying, put your priorities right. Amen. And the priority is to be part of the family, to be part of the family of God, to be able to shine His glory, to be able to reflect His character. That's what a son and a daughter should be doing. And that's really part of the instruction. Now, obviously, Amen. the commandment embraces all of us. You're a family. We're a family. And we need to respect, to love, and to upheld what God created. That, for me, is that significant. Amen. Amen. All right. We are out of time. So. Okay, I will wrap up with the final text that I would like to have up on the screen. Psalm 51, verse 10 through 13. And... Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Renew. That's fine. Steadfast. Yeah. Huh? Steadfast. A steadfast. I right is what I'm, I memorized. Sorry. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners shall be converted. It is the heart and it is our desire that our hearts are clean and that our spirit, our right spirit is renewed within us. Going on to clean hands or clean heart? Yes, clean hands and a clean heart. How's that? So um, let, let's continue on with August 5th, which incidentally I thought it was interesting that that was my actual birthday. So I was like, okay, I guess. Oh, happy birthday. Thank happy you. birthday. So um, let's, let's read from Mark 7, 14 to 19. Is that on the screen? Okay, somebody want to read for us? And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban. That is a gift to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God of no but effect. It, okay. What? I think we were supposed to read 14 through 19, and we're reading 9. Oops, we are. That's the wrong ones. Okay, here it is now. There we go. Sorry. <coughs> well, I, think I think I had my, my text where I was at, but go ahead. 
When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things which defile him. If I defile a man. That was our memory verse. If anyone has ears, let him hear. And again it says, let him hear. Then he had entered a house away from the crowd. His disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. So one, one thought I had is when Pilate washed his hands of Christ's blood, um, did that really exonerate him in the, in the eyes of God from his guilt of condemning Christ, or uh, sending Christ to his death? And uh, I think I saw Jerry shaking his head, no. So of course it didn't uh, exonerate him. So essentially I think what the Jews were doing when they had... Um, when they when they were doing their ritual services were essentially saying I'm washing my hands from sin so if I've contacted any sinners but instead of that God is saying or Christ is saying to them hey look it's, it's not this rituals that you do that are gonna that are gonna have any meaning to God it's actually by your intentions and your heart is so I think with that the lesson also points out that Christ was not intending to eliminate the laws about um, clean and unclean meats because I, I think they weren't even touching on this. It was mainly touching the rituals that they had. Um, and so the clean and unclean meats were given for their health and those were not changed. So Christ was not changing the law. He was just telling them, hey look you guys are completely misunderstanding and misinterpreting this. So I think the way this all happened is that Back in the days before Babylon, before the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites had all these tendencies to go astray. So God would tell them, do this, and then some people would have their own idols, and then effectually um, idolatry kept coming in. And so then the priests, after their return from the Babylonian captivity, decided, hey, we're going to make up all these extra rules to make sure that none of the people go astray. These are going to be very explicit and simple, except that in doing that, they were taking away the essence of what God was trying to teach. So with that, let's continue. Well done. In, in a sense, um, I, I, like, I like the way you, you, you positioned what you proposed uh, the topic at, at, uh, at hand. But in, in a sense, I really look at, uh, and you brought in a very interesting illustration, idols. In a sense, they were idealizing their own righteousness. And they had forgotten that they were filthy rags. And part of the problem of, of really um, walking as a Christian is to think that you've arrived and that you're no longer filthy rags. And then all of a sudden you're able to criticize, you're able to condemn, you're able to justify. And what Jesus is really saying to, uh, to, to in, in this particular case, to the leaders of the people, is very simple. It's, you know, they would be simply saying to them, "Listen, you have not arrived. You have You're still filthy rags. You have a responsibility to you in humility to dedicate yourself to the Lord and walk in the Lord." so that people can see the Lord through you. That's really part of the message in this particular part of Scripture. Definitely. Thank you for, for that, Victor. So now um, I was going to read a few quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy, because I think that Ellen White does a good job of um, making clear, which may not have been as clear originally if you only read the text. So um, let's go to Traditions of Men versus the Law of God. As before, the ground of complaint was his disregard of the traditional precepts that, encum that encumbered the law of God. These were professedly de designed to guard the observance of the law, but they were regarded as more sacred than the law itself. Yeah. 
when they came in collision with the commandments given from Sinai, preference was given to the rabbinical precepts. And then she goes on to say, among the observances most strenuously enforced was that of a ceremonial purification. A neglect of the forms were to be observed before eating was counted as a heinous sin to be punished both in this world and in the next, and it was regarded as a virtue to destroy the transgressor. So this sounds like this was really serious to him. They would actually put to death people who didn't do their rituals. Uh, the rules in regard to purification were numberless. The period of a lifetime was scarcely sufficient time for one to learn them all. <laughs> the life of those who tried to observe rabbinical requirements was one long struggle against ceremonial defilement, an endless round of washings and purifications. While the people were occupied with trifling distinctions and observances, which God had not required, their attention was turned away from the great principles of his law. And I, I think that's the key part, is that Satan was succeeding by uh, adding all this minutia to keep people like, oh, did I, did I touch so-and-so, and did I do the right number of minutes of purification for this amount? And so they had all this complicated system that just kind of kept people on this treadmill of ever ongoing um, ceremonial purifications. So let's go on. And then the, we called them, uh, so Jesus made, so it's interesting that the approach, rather than Jesus defending himself, he went on the attack. So he's like, you guys are wrong. Uh, <coughs> Jesus made no attempt to defend himself or his disciples. He made no reference to the charges against him, but proceeded to show the spirit that actuated <coughs> these sticklers for human rights. Uh, rights in this case is R-I-T-E-S, not rights as in, <laughs> okay. He gave them an example of what they were repeatedly doing and had done, done just before coming in search of him. Full well you reject the commandment of God, he said that you may keep your own tradition. And then I'm going to skip ahead and go, um, so the last sentence in here says, Thus he was at liberty both in life and in death to dishonor and defraud his parents under the cover of a pretend devotion to God. So basically he's saying that they were allowing people a way out of taking care of their parents by just calling, well, it's dedicated to God, so I can't help you. So that this was a way of like an undutiful child to um, get out of it. And then he goes on, and he, he's like, uh, but the apparent zeal for God, and this is what Victor was saying earlier, uh, was on the part of the priests and rabbis, it was a pretense to cover a desire for self-aggrandizement. Yes. So basically they were trying to say, look, I'm so righteous, therefore you shouldn't uh, count against me the fact that we killed the Son of God because I washed my hands properly before eating. Yes. <laughs> so... Uh, so it <laughs> goes on and says, "Ye hypocrites," he said, addressing the wily spies. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, "This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart, heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines and the commandments of men." The words of Christ were an arraignment of the whole system of Phariseeism. He declared that by placing their requirements above the divine precepts, the rabbis were setting themselves above God. And then the last part here that I had from uh, Desire of Ages talks about the, the reaction that Christ wore had on them. The deputies from Jerusalem were filled with rage. They could not accuse Christ as a violator of the law from Sinai, for he spoke as its defender against their traditions. The great precepts of the law, which he had presented, appeared in striking contrast to the petty rules that men had devised. To the multitude, and afterwards, more fully to his disciples, Jesus explained that the defilement comes not from without, but from within. Purity and impurity pertain to the soul. It is the evil deed, the evil word, the evil thought, the transgression, 
of the law of God, not the neglect of external man-made ceremonies that defiles a man. And, the, and then I was going to do a, um, an application to today. Are we close to out of time? Okay. Okay. Um, so today, uh, I think, in the, now the, I'm paraphrasing from the great controversy, which says three, three great errors, like Satan controls the whole Christian world. And those two great errors, um, can you switch to the traditions in Christianity today to negate the law of God? Is that on there? Um, Sunday sacredness. So the, the Catholic Church claims that their tradition of worshiping God on Sunday supersedes the biblical word of God uh, of the commandment to worship on the Sabbath. And they claim that God gave them that authority. But given what uh, Christ said in these passages, how would you take that? Would you say that Christ would be telling him, oh, okay, it's okay to use your traditions to negate the word of God, or would he say, you hypocrites, <laughs> you are negating the word of God? Last one. And the last one was the immortality of no, the no, soul. No. The, 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 you asked you. Oh, the last yeah, one, okay. The, this is what he's saying, you know, <laughs> you go back to the word of God. Right, right. So... Today, most of Christianity is bought into the, um, the Greek philosophy that the soul is immortal and if you go to Hades when you die, you don't really die, so the, the soul continues on. So through that deception, Satan opens up the door to spiritualism. And spiritualism um, is a way that he can use to... Uh, he can use spiritualism as a, as a matter of uh, getting people to uh, accept his deceptive teachings. And so in conclusion, um, think, are there any traditions or customs which I follow that do not agree with any portion of God's law? And then could toleration of people be confused with toleration of sin? And we are to love sinners and hate the sin, but instead some love the sin and hate the sinners. So I think we should tolerate people, but not false teachings. Amen. With that, we'll move on to the next day. Crumbs, crumbs for the dogs. Yes, <laughs> crumbs for the dogs. I like this one. And I like this one because this shows a feisty mother who doesn't give up when it's about her babies. And we see that. <laughs> we see that that uh, this, this woman's got some spunk. We'll see this. So Mark 7, 24 through 30 reads, From here he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now where was Tyre and Sidon? It was on the coast. But was it a, was it, was it a Jewish neighborhood? Yeah, it, it's a Gentile neighborhood, isn't it? So we need to put this in context. We need to realize that God was um, <clears throat> with, in, in a Gentile situation here. And he entered a house and wanted to know, wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. So his reputation had gone before him even, even into this Gentile area. And verse 25 says, For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. <clears throat> the woman was a Greek, Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So what do we see here? We see a mother who's really struggled with her child. And many of us struggle with our children. We know that. And <clears throat> so this mother was getting pretty desperate. Um, and so she kept saying, please, take this demon away from my daughter. And verse 27, but Jesus said to her, let the children be, the, be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, where did this come from? Seriously, why would God say, I mean, he, she's asking about her daughter. So her daughter's obviously a child, right? Most likely. But he's saying, let the little children eat first. And it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So why was, she saying, why was he saying this? Yeah, you 
we're on the right track. The Gentiles, <clears throat> you got to stay away from those Gentiles. Those Gentiles over here. you got to stay away from those. Because they're unclean. you got to stay away from them, this defiling thing. Oh, you're going to move. You're funny. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm going to get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stay I'm going to stay away from those gentiles and he's saying to her you're a gentile why should I feed you that's really what he's saying here go ahead yeah but back to the previous <clears throat> one the whole this is about washing their hands mm -hmm. if they touch any food that the gentiles touch then it was empty they had to wash their hands yeah. there are people that they were supposed to Yeah, that's true. So anyway, um, but throw the bread to the little dogs. Now, when he's talking about little dogs here, it's not quite the same as big dogs, right? When he talks, you're thinking about puppies. You're thinking about something cute and cuddly. You're not thinking about um, dogs. And how are dogs thought of in in the Middle East, and still are today, for that matter? Un unclean. Unclean. And socially Yeah. Well, in fact, I think it's still an insult today if you call in the Middle East, you call somebody a dog, they're not going to be pleased. Yes. <laughs> Armand's laughing. She knows I this stuff. I think we can call someone a dog here today. <laughs> oh, you know, sometimes it can be like hip. Yo, dog, what's up, man? <laughs> <laughs> but if you said that in the Middle East, you're likely to get punched in the face uh -huh. for saying it. <laughs> I think also, like, we do have cartoons with dogs. Little dogs are cute to us. And, and where they're teaching things they're like, like his. Paw Patrol, Snoopy, what else do we have with cute oh, dogs? There's also <laughs> Christian ones like Yellow Dog. <laughs> yeah. So what we're, seeing, what we're seeing here is Jesus is really kind of putting this lady down, isn't he? You know, why should I help your daughter? You're nothing but a Gentile. This is really what he's, what he's saying to her. And that's, that's odd, the effect coming from Christ. But what's he really doing here? He's testing her, isn't he? He's, well, he's, yeah, he's also out. making a point to his disciples that this is how, you, how the Jews would react, but that's not what I would have you, how I would have you react. Yeah, that's, that's the interesting part about whenever Christ said something or did something like this. It wasn't just for one person. It was for the whole crowd to get something out of. And it may be something different for each person in the crowd. But what does this woman say <clears throat> in verse 28? And she answered him and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat the, the children's breadcrumbs. So what's she saying? Even the insignificant ones <clears throat> get fed. Get fed. Yeah. Yeah. He said to her, For thus saying, Go your way, the demon has been out of your daughter. When she had come to her house, she found the demon gone, and her daughter lying in her bed. So, what, what kind of applications does this have for us today? Well, I'm thinking of something that applies to our world today. When we hear someone call someone... Um, <coughs> something unkind, we cringe. Mm -hmm. Though we don't realize and we don't think of ourselves doing that, but we may do it in thought, private thought, um, where we judge someone or we think unkind or whatever, we, but we might not say it. I think when Jesus said it, um, he said things that they said plenty in their culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that that woman was called a dog before, yeah, by others in some way. Well, let's let's take a look here at what the Desire of Ages has to say, and it's page 401. By his dealings with her, he has shown 
that she has been regarded as an outcast from Israel, this person is no longer an alien, but a child of God's household. As a child, it is her privilege to share the Father's gift. So he's breaking down this wall, isn't he, between the Jews and the Gentiles that has existed for so many years. Um, also, I wanted to read here um, from the Desire of Pages 401. It says, the Syrophoenician woman urged her case with increased earnestness, bowing at Christ's feet and crying, Lord, help me. Jesus still apparently rejected her entreaties according to the feeling that to the unfeeling prejudice of the Jews answered, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. This was virtually asserting that it was not just lavish blessings brought to the favored people of God upon strangers and aliens from Israel. This answer would have utterly discouraged a less earnest seeker, but this woman saw that her opportunity had come. Beneath the apparent refusal of Jesus, she saw a compassion that could not that he could not hide. So while there were many blessings given to Israel, was there not a blessing for her? She looked upon the dog, and had she not then a dog's claim to a crumb from his bounty? Here Christ meets one unfortunate despised race that has not been favored with the light of God's word, yet she yields at once to the divine influence of Christ and has implicit faith in her ability to grant the favor she seeks. She begs, she begs for the crumbs that fall from the master's table. If she may have the privilege of a dog, she willingly would be regarded as a dog. She has no national or religious prejudice or pride to influence her course. She immediately acknowledged Jesus as the Redeemer and as being able to do all that she asks of him. Pretty, pretty, um, pretty important that God is no respecter of persons. We are all the same, and he is willing to give to those who don't know him or have not known him just as much as he is ready to give to his children. That's love. That's love. Okay, Michelle, mm. you're going to talk about tongue, being tongue-tied. Tongue-tied. So tongue-tied, as we're going through and following Jesus, um, we, we come to the one, uh, the parable, um, or this is not a parable, this is an actual event, where Jesus heals a person that's deaf and mute. So an introduction to this section that's found in Mark 7, verses 31 through 37, um, we read that, and again, departing from a region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. So, and then the, the story continues, and they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. So, you know, we are told again that he went you know, uh, why is the writer so plainly putting it? It's describing that he really took a circuitous route. He didn't go in a straight, direct. He wasn't. He had a purpose, maybe that was driven by the Holy Spirit and God, and that was he was following the promptings of the Holy Spirit, um, very likely because he had a mission, and you know this route gave him additional time to teach his disciples, but also. Maybe it was a divine appointment set by God that he would meet this man and heal this man and we would get to read um, about it too and take something for our day to day. Now we are told that this, it doesn't tell us who brought the man to Jesus. They say they. 
Uh, we don't know who brought those men to Jesus. But I think we should read the rest of the text, uh, starting with verse 30. You can read from the beginning or read from verse 33. No, uh, uh, go back one. Verse 33 or 32. So they brought him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. They begged him to do something very specific they have seen him do before. Put his hand, touch people, and heal. So what does Jesus do? And I would like someone, if possible, to read this loud on verse 33 on uh, all the way to verse 37. Uh, it's not working, okay. Not then, uh, all right, I'll read it. And he, took, and he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the, uh, the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded that they should tell no one, uh, but the more he commanded, the more widely they proclaimed it. Then they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things. He makes both the deaf hear and the mute to speak. Um, yes. So as we read this text, you know, we, we, uh, there's a lot of detail to take in that's different than some of the other stories. Like, we read that in verse 32 that the people asked him to touch him and heal him. But instead, Jesus does something totally different. And since our real microphone's not working, I think we're, I'm going to go through, talking through it. And please feel free to say, and if someone says something, we want to repeat it so it's heard online too. Um, so what was the, this man that was brought? What was his condition? And you know, if we try to at least put ourselves in his shoes, like, uh, feel what he's feeling. It's a little hard to do, but we know he could not hear people around him. He was, in many ways, isolated. Um, and he could not speak. He could not say what was on his mind, ask questions, or anything. Um, so it, it was he, this deafness that he had and this um, inability to speak um, Isolated it, and we don't know if this was a long-standing problem the, that he had. The text doesn't tell us. So, well, I think it could be inferred that he was probably born this way because usually people who go deaf later in life, their speech does not affect it. But people who are born deaf, um, their speech is is even if they have it, it's it's different. It's off. It's not normal speech. Because I think not being able to hear, you, you don't modulate your voice the same way. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying it's probably born with it. Very likely, yes. But before this, the scriptures, I read that. Uh, Verse, oh, oh, before. He, speaking of Christ, sighed. Yes. And that's used That's in verse 30, 35, I think. Let's see. Um, he's almost si the Jesus sighing. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, "Be open." Well, I think we're going to get to it on Thursday, uh -huh. or, or at least uh, maybe that's a There's different time. There's another story. Sighed. That's another story. He sighed on multiple occasions. This is one of them, and that's a question, a very good question. Why did he sigh? You know? What are you taking something out of you? He's expressing. Yes. So Jesus is expressing not only in words, he's expressing with a sigh as well. And it may reflect his heart. It may reflect him, his God's heart as well. We don't think of God uh, sighing. But, you know, the, what's going on with us, the sufferings that, like, this man experienced, the things that are happening with the people in the audience, um, all around, makes God and Jesus sigh, yes? Yeah, maybe he's thinking back to the garden and he, mm -hmm. uh, all the suffering that he's been dealing with, there's so many Yeah, all the suffering. He 
we may be thinking, like you said, to the Garden of Eden, all this suffering may be unnecessary. Oh yes, and it, it is distor distorting. Everything that's been put in place, taking it away from God, is distorting. What is it distorting? The character of God, it, it's, and it's enslaving, and it's burdening, and it's hurting people. Uh, and Jesus feels it. Um, so, but he also does something very unusual. It says he puts his fingers in the man's ears, um, touches his tongue, and sighs. Uh, Jesus touches the affected parts of the man that he will heal. And then comes the question, why the sigh? Um, I think we find Jesus repeatedly coming in very close to us. And um, this is such an instance where he is touching the, the very parts that are afflicted. And you know, we may have various afflictions. Um, it, some of them come also from within. Um, some are on the outside. And I think um, Jesus touches us in the depths of our situations, the, the parts that hurt the most, that's where he touches. And I think, and he is sighing. He is feeling the pain. He sees the, the, what we're going through and how unnecessary it is. And, you know, there is a past, like the Garden of Eden, where he created a perfect world without all of this. And now here it is, and we're all suffering. And that there is a day coming where it will be no more like that. He will heal um, even the tears. Not only the bodies will be all new. Um, so um, this lesson, I, we don't have a lot of text. The question, the biggest question I had in my notes was, uh, why the sigh? Why the sigh? Um, as we look to God's heart, um, I think it touches us. I don't know how you feel, but when I see God touching the parts most hurt and I see him sighing, it, it tells me God is truly by my side, feeling with me, caring. And uh, I think for me it opens up Christ, God's feelings. And I'm going to repeat it for the people in the audience that, since our microphone's not working, what you just said, I'll paraphrase it for the um, audience, that God has feelings. We see his feelings. He is, has power, and there's the power of his creation, but God has feelings. And uh, truly, he cares. We stand before a God that cares about us. And, you know, this brief story also illustrates what God can do for those who will willingly turn to him. Um, and just like perhaps like this man, we have experienced um, pain. Uh, but we may have also experienced in our own lives something like the reticence of sharing uh, our faith or feeling tongue-tied. Uh, feeling tongue-tied, you know, as you know, maybe unable to speak. Um, this miracle offers encouragement that the Lord Jesus can open our ears um, and he to be sensitive to others' needs and to share a re ready word to lift them on their journey. I also think of the Holy Spirit. Jesus walked, led by the Spirit. The, we are told that, Jesus, that the Spirit took him in the wilderness. And while in this story we're not told of that, we see Jesus totally acting, directed by God and touching people. And we lose sight of that just because it's not mentioned in the lesson. But I think my greatest benefit is to daily ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit to lead me um, 
to those that need, to help me speak when I need to speak, to help me feel with others when I need to feel with others like Jesus did. So um, I think there's a lot we can say about this story. But I think in the interest of time, we should move on to um, the next part of our lesson, which is watch out for bad bread. Okay, so here's how to watch out for bad bread, aka the leaven of the Pharisees, uh, which is hypocrisy. So um, I think th what Christ is warning against and this time he sighs, I think, because of this reason, uh, it's, which is to have us avoid deceptive reasoning. So there are some who are wise in their eyes and who pervert the teaching of scriptures to make themselves look good, but in reality they are fools. Jesus called out the religious teachers for their self-importance and their deceptive reasoning. We need to learn this lesson so that we do not fall into the same trap. So let's read Mark. 8, 11 to 13. Any volunteers? No, the oh. problem. I could read. Yes, I can read. The Pharisees came out and began to dispute him, with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them, and getting onto the boat, he departed to the other side. I think this side is clear. He's a little bit upset with them. Well, he's also saying, like, look, I've had the voice of God from heaven. I've done thousands of miracles. My birth place all was exactly according to prophecy so he's like what, what more do you want I mean if you don't believe the thousands of miracles I've done what else could I show you well go ahead really they're just like can you do a miracle on demand and Jesus is like really <laughs> <laughs> but, but how different are we Lord I need a miracle now Yeah, he wants you to learn something. Yeah. All right. So, well, let's go to the desire of ages because I find that it sheds a lot of light, and then we can also discuss those things. The sign from heaven. Um, now the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Christ asking for a sign from heaven. When in the days of Joshua, Israel went out to battle with the Canaanites at Beth Haran, the sun stood still at the leader's command until victory was gained, and many similar wonders had been manifest in their history. Some such sign was demanded of Jesus, but these signs were not what the Jews needed. No mere external evidence could benefit them. What they needed was not intellectual enlightenment, it's spiritual renovation. And actually that reminded me of when uh, Nicodemus came to Christ, right? He's like, you, you got to be born again. So I think Nicodemus wanted to discuss um, kind of the general intellectual part of Christ's uh, mission on earth. So he's like, no, no, you need to be born again. So I think this is the same message. You guys need to be born again and that um, no matter what miracle I would do for you, it wouldn't be enough. So if you choose to doubt, there's no miracle that's going to convince you. Mm. So then let's read about... Scott, you have a question. Oh, go ahead. And last week, there was a stunning sentence. They were so hard that it was impossible for any, anything that he did. He just did miracles daily before them, and it wasn't enough. And we're describing God who created the world, who created us, and he could do no miracles. Yeah. It's a stunning sentence. Amen. It seems to connect here, too. Mm -hmm. So let's...
hypocrites read about spiritual renovation. O oh, you hypocrites, said Jesus, you discern the face of the sky by studying the sky. They could foretell the weather, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Christ's own words spoken with the power of the Holy Spirit that convicted them of sin were the sign that God had given for their salvation and the signs direct from heaven that had been given to attest the mission of Christ. The song of the angels to the shepherds, the star that guided the wise men, the dove and the voice from heaven at his baptism were witnesses for him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why does this generation seek after a sign? There shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So I think this one comes from Matthew. So he, he added a sign here. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, Christ was the, at the same time in the heart of the earth. And as the preaching of Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so Christ's preaching was to be a sign to his generation. But what a contrast in the reception of the world. Word. The people of the great heathen city trembled as they were heard the warning from the God from God. Kings and nobles humbled themselves. The high and the lowly together cried to the God of heaven, and his mercy was granted unto them. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment against this generation, Christ said, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the pre preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. But lest we rise up and judge the people before us, I think we have to be careful that this belief still persists today. So let's read the next one. Unbelief persists today. Um, when the message of truth is presented in our day, there are many who, like the Jews, cry, show us a sign, work us a miracle. Christ wrought no miracle at the demand of the Pharisees. He wrought no miracle in the wilderness in answer to Satan's insinuations. He does not impart to us power to vindicate ourselves or to satisfy the demands of unbelief and pride. So.